What is up, everybody? Sam here with Fall Obsession Podcast, coming to you guys with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. This week is myself and good friend Mike Barons talking about archery, the topic specifically of how far you can shoot. Um, really, really awesome conversation. Y'all, you guys know I love archery and this is my bread and butter. Um, so my, my passion Jeff definitely comes out with this conversation. Um, but before we turn it over to the episode, got to hit a few points real quick. First and foremost, Ridge Rock Hunt Company. They are a podcast partner, Derek and Lacey over there at Ridge Rock. They do, um, a lot to help promote and represent Fall Obsession. They're big supporters of our brand and the podcast. Really appreciate them. They book hunts with vetted outfitters across the country. So if you guys are looking to plan that next once in a lifetime hunt or even just a next adventure, want to do something you hadn't done before, whatever the case might be, give Derek a call. He will work with you on timeline, licensing, um, cost, location, all that good stuff. He will help figure out what's going to work best for you based on the criteria you give him. So give him a shot. Ridge Rock Hunt Company. You can find him on their website and on social media. Next is the Outdoor Call radio app. Outdoors Dan from Respect the Game TV, he created an app that you guys can get on your Android or your Apple phone or device, whatever the case might be. And you guys can stream hunting shows and podcasts um, on a loop basically every single day of the week. He's got different shows lined out for different days of the week. You can catch Fall Obsession podcast on there on Mondays, same as our new publications. So if you haven't downloaded the Outdoor Call Radio app, please go ahead and do so. Dan was actually my guest on our podcast in our last episode, episode 155. So if you guys haven't gone back and listened to 155 yet, definitely encourage you guys to do that as well. So if you haven't downloaded the app, go check it out, see everything he's got going on. He also does some live shows um, a few times a week as well, and all that's available on select uh, radio stations across the country, and then you can also follow him on Facebook and catch his live videos as well. So the Outdoor Call Radio app, go check them out. Finally, Fall Obsession Podcast, you guys know the drill. Be sure that you like and follow us on whatever social media platform you are active on. We are on all major social platforms, and the podcast is on all major podcast platforms, as well as our YouTube channel, Carbon TV and Waypoint TV. We've gotten plugged in with that Carbon TV family, and it's been an awesome experience for us, and it's really given our podcast a huge bump, and we really appreciate you guys if you are tuning in on Carbon TV. On that note, if you guys have your own hunting outdoor brand, company, organization, whatever the case might be that you represent, and you guys are interested in um, being a part of our Fall Obsession podcast and promoting your brand on all these platforms to these tens of thousands of people that listen to our podcast, um, then reach out to us. Go to fallobsession.com slash podcast. There's a form that you guys can fill out on there. And that'll put you in contact with our production team. And we can start talking to you about the advertising opportunities we have here on Fall Obsession Podcast if you're interested. So go check that out. I'm going to stop rambling. Thank you guys for listening. I'm going to turn it over to the episode now. You're listening to another Fall Obsession Podcast episode. Oh, you got her, dude. She's down. Let's go. Dude, I just shot a deer of a lifetime. Freaking smoked him. One with nature, and if you're a believer, one with God. Definitely gets your heart pumping. Boy, you are in trouble. Fall Obsession Podcast. All right, guys, thank you all for joining us. Another Fall Obsession podcast. Back again with Mike Barons from across the street. <laughs> We've uh, been dishing out some some good podcast episodes in recent weeks, so welcome back, man. Appreciate Thanks for having it. me again. Yeah. So our where we wanted to get into everything, we're talking about hunting and archery, as most of our conversations seem to trend. Um, but one thing that uh, you sent me a link. Right week or so ago however long ago it was um and some of our listeners viewers may have even read the article themselves it was linked to an article and in that article it was talking about how the the author specifically his mentality behind why he won't shoot his bow at a animal more than 30 yards away i think the title of the article is along those lines as well yeah it's but yeah, that's uh 
that's kind of what we want to dive in because you sent it to me and it obviously spurred up a conversation between us, you know, talking about all the archery stuff that we talk about. And yeah, literally I I won't shoot past 30 yards with my bow is the title. Is the title of the article. And again, I'm I'm sure some of our, some of our listeners have uh, probably read that themselves, but, and not that it's a bad article. It's one school of thought is what it is. Right. And I'm not here to, to bash the author or bash this mentality necessarily, but I personally, and, and what I told you in our text thread, I don't necessarily agree with it. And it's not my mentality. Uh, if you will. And if, as you read through the article and you went through it, they talked a lot about, um, you know, the variables that happen past 30 yards, the, uh, the potential for the animal to move, the animal to hear your bow, and all these other, mm-hmm. other things they listed off, which again, they're not wrong, but I immediately started thinking about all of the, all of the guys that I've seen shoot long range and kill long range very skilled archers that are going after elk pronghorn mule deer alaskan creatures such as moose caribou goats all that kind of stuff up there um and that are taking very very long 80 to 100 yard shots Mm -hmm. with their bow and absolutely drilling it so that's where my mind immediately went when you pass this article down to me and thought too about my own mentality behind how I train and how I shoot the flip side of it is like where I hunt and I know similar to where you hunt all my shots are short right and they are short for a reason and part of that is because I can make I can build that environment right you can build that environment and make it your own and make it um you know more reasonable in in the realm of an archer um, but when you go out west you go to those farther out places you don't have that luxury and that's why you in my mind you have to be skilled enough especially if that's your if that's your trip that you're planning you got to be skilled enough to be able to go that route with your bow well and even you know states like texas where you can shoot at a feeder yeah versus you know a lot of your midwestern states you can't so you might only get that 50 60 yard shot yeah but my mind immediately went to, oh, thank God I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> Again, two different stages of, of <laughs> archery, and, that, and that's what I like too. You know, we, 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 have, we have the contrast, and we've been following your journey for the last you know, year or less on the podcast, you know, talking about how you've gotten into archery and, and learning at rapid stages. You came over today and showed me a picture of you know, the new uh, mm-hmm. single pin bow sight that you just ordered too so making those those strides and those advancements and you know I, I know you talk about you know where you're comfortable shooting as far as distances right. but then that sight you just ordered man that's gonna that's gonna over time change the game for you too because you're gonna do pretty quick yeah you're gonna i know you shoot out to 40 kind of 50 max in your practice sessions but you get that sight on there you're gonna start you know well it says 52 here on my tape. Let's go to 52. Let's go to 55. Let's try 60 now. <laughs> well, it's a comfort thing too. I mean, you get that in there. And, and of course, like I said last time when we were talking about this, it's for me mentally, it works better because right. I grew up on a front side post. Yeah. So having that single pin mimics the front side post. Now I'm more comfortable. I mean, theoretically right away, just with that one piece of equipment. And then as I start playing with it, as long as it's hitting and it's driving tax at whatever range I'm at and I dial it in and it's right there every single time, it's like, well, okay, here, yeah, we're good now. Yeah. So that'll, it's, it's, a, you know, you have it on the podcast too, you know, different, uh, different episodes that you have the mental game. Yeah. And it's not just you and the deer. Yeah. It, it, it all ties together and and that and that's part of what I love about it is you can you can take archery and you can analyze just one little topic one little thing but the second you start diving into it and start rabbit trailing off of it it just goes right back to everything else mm-hmm. archery and this article circling back to it talking about I won't shoot past 30 yards um, with my bow again it comes down to shooter it comes down to what you're comfortable with it comes down to your conditions in the moment. 
-hmm. Like if I, if I have, even at one of, I'm thinking of one of my stands in particular right now, if I have a deer out past my feeder, a good buck that I want to put an arrow in, it's late season. I like, it's now or never with this dude. I've been in that situation before, could very well be in it again. And he's at 45 yards, let's say. I'm going to take that shot mm -hmm. unless I just have some crazy wind conditions or something to where I'm not confident in my arrow flight. I'm not confident that my shot is going to be where I place it. And that's why you practice at, you know, right. these distances and stuff. You practice with a little bit of wind. You don't have to get, you know, super crazy wind at these long distances unless you're so inclined. But, um, you know, you practice in these environments so that you're, when well, we've talked about that before too, you know, right. about being being prepared for that kind of thing i think back also to i'm and i'm pretty sure i've talked about on our podcast at some point or another but another scenario i've had in montana where i you know that year i went up there ready to shoot a pronghorn at 100 yards if i had to with my bow i was putting them in a softball size group at 100 i was like all right let's do this right and the closest i got was 120 to a good <laughs> good buck and you have that thought in your mind. You're like, can I fling this arrow and see what happens? There wasn't crazy wind. He was just at 120, and I wasn't getting any closer. He wasn't coming any closer. It was This was it if it was going to be it. And in those moments, too, you kind of have to go with your gut. That thought crossed my mind. I was like, uh, I, could, I could probably try to float one in there. I could probably try to guess. But then the better side of my archery brain got a hold of me. I was like, no. You haven't shot this rig, this site, that right. distance ever before, ever more than 100. Don't try to do it now. My mentality then was, all right, well, if I go back up there, you better believe I'm going to be going past where my tape is because <laughs> now I've been in that situation. But those are the things that we learn over time, right. too. I know at 45 yards, that buck standing past my feeder, I know I can make that shot. And if the animal's behavior is indicating to me that he's calm enough and comfortable enough himself that he's not gonna he's not gonna bolt the second he hears something then it's a no-brainer for me and that's the other thing too i think people don't think about is you also literally watch your animal's behavior because if you have an animal that's on alert in there and this this is at any distance really you have an animal that's in there on alert and you got to be thinking about you know, are they going to duck your arrow? What are they going to do? Because the, they're just more hypersensitive to mm -hmm. that when they do hear something actually happen when you release that arrow. Whereas if they're more calm, you might just get the head lift up because, oh, what was that? And by then your arrow's there. Mm -hmm. Opposed to, you know, they're already on alert. They hear that. And instead of the head going up, you get the bolt straight out of the gate. So other other schools of thought with it too. But or you get the one that we had last year when Carrie shot hers, shot it with the rifle, noisy. You pretty much expect everything to leave the area, right? No, not this one. He was confused. <laughs> he just kind of meandered around, and he walked about 50 yards in front of the deer blind, looked at us, said hi, just kind of chilled out for a minute. And like He had no idea what just happened, but apparently he had no clue why George was taking a nap. <laughs> so there was that, too. We, we've all seen those, too, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I've shot a few deer before where they've run off and there's one or two others around just like, oh, that was cool. Yeah. Let's go back. To, let's go back to eating. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. And another guy shot a, about a 350 pound boar at the feeder. After the feeder had gone off, the deer were watching. They were coming in. He could see them and he was like, man, I don't know. They don't look very big. I'm gonna go ahead and shoot this pig. He shoots the pig. 20 minutes go by. All the deer come in, step over the pig's body, and start eating corn. Didn't phase them. That's Texas for you right there. <laughs> <laughs> Target-rich environment for sure. Right. I, one thing that stuck out to me in that article was um, they specifically mentioned like the animal, the deer, hearing the sound of your bow going off. And I've kind of thrown it out there. I want... I want other people to chime in and comments on, you know, the podcast, social media, the video, whatever. Um, I, I've heard this a few times. I don't know if it's true or not, because I've never been the one being shot at with a bow and arrow. 
<laughs> hopefully never will be. But um, I've been told before multiple times that unless you're like close quarters, like 20 yards, if you're any farther than that really, that a deer is actually going to react more to the sound of the arrow coming toward them opposed to the sound of the bow going off. Now, I know if you have a, a loud bow or an old bow, it's probably a little bit different, but like the way technology is going in the archery industry, these things are getting more quiet and more quiet every day. Um, I don't know. It was an interesting, interesting theory, and I don't necessarily disagree with it. I don't know if it's 100% true either. Again, never been on that end of a bow and arrow, but... It was another interesting thing that I just want to throw out there for folks because um, I'd like to hear if anybody else has any other opinions on that. So it's an interesting thought. The one I hadn't thought of. I mean, I was always, you know, obviously with my infinite knowledge in archery at this point. Um, <laughs> you know, the only term I've really heard was jump in the string. So, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But I didn't think about it from that perspective as well, hearing the whistle or whatever sound it makes coming in. But, yeah. Um, yeah, that would make sense. I mean, they hear a lot better than we do. Right. So, you know, that's that was always in my head too is, you know, with these close-up shots, sure, you might catch them on a straight shot without them jumping the string or whatever sound they hear, which is a major point in the article. But you also have a heightened sense of hearing that these animals have and what are they going to be able to hear when you draw that arrow back that was what i was thinking the first shot that i took i was like, man how am i going to draw this arrow back they're like right there in front of me yeah and that was what i was worried about was that not them hearing the bow they were hearing the draw and that was my concern so i was, I, I was like how do how do these guys do this Cause I'm sitting there trying to draw this thing back, like kind of slow and controlled. So like, I didn't make a lot of noise and I'm almost exhausted by the time I finally got set. And I'm like, how do these guys do this crap? This is insane. It, but it worked. It, it's a, it's definitely a process. And, and that's, I, I'm a huge fan and granted again, I'm a Texas hunter. I'm, I'm not a experienced Western guy that has been in these situations where you just got you got to draw and make the call quick and make it all happen real quick, get a range quick, all that kind of stuff. I here in Texas, at least with with our place, I try to let the animal settle in as as best I can, and it's a process. Like to your point, the whole getting set up and drawing back, it is it's a process. Like if I whether I'm standing or sitting. Normally, if I'm in my tree stand um, for, you know, these extended hunts and stuff, I I normally will stand for 15 minutes, and then I'll, I'll sit down for five. And I'll stand for 15 and sit down for five. That's normally my routine in my tree stand. So if I'm sitting, obviously, you have to incorporate, all right, now i got to get stood up, which is a whole other mm -hmm. process. You talk about, you know your legs hurting when you get halfway up and you're in that crunch position, they suddenly look over in your direction <laughs> and you're just stuck there. <laughs> you know, your quads are burning at that point, but you got to get stood up. But once you get to that point, or if you're already at that point, if I have something coming in, I mean, obviously first decision I want to make is, am I going to shoot this animal? And if the answer is yes, at that point, I have to have a plan for getting my bow. I have to have a plan for getting everything lined up, but I want to I want to make sure that I want to give myself every chance I can for a clean shot. And the more comfortable that animal is in the environment it just walked into, the better. And obviously, you got to take your own precautions with, you know, playing the wind, your scent control if you're into all that, that kind of stuff to help that. But once that animal gets in there, I'm not a gotta grab my bow immediately and just get a shot off unless it looks like like if the wind's swirling or this buck is really antsy well then I gotta pick up the pace but if I have a calm animal I'm gonna take my time getting ready for my shot because it helps me stay calm and it just leads to an even cleaner shot in my opinion so which that kind of leads back to the one that I got in the backyard last year I mean I took him with a rifle but he didn't leave any time for thought whatsoever. It was all reaction. There, I, I don't honestly. I don't know that either one of us would have been able to get a good shot on him with a bow. Yeah, 
at least of all me. But I mean, I have my doubts that you would have because you just didn't give you any time. Well, and that bigger mature deer, that's 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 the game you play. Like, oftentimes your your does, even your coal bucks, sometimes you know you can you can play the the waiting game. But those situations, like I mentioned, where you got to pick up the pace and kick it into gear, is normally with those bigger, more mature bucks. Yep. So. Yeah, because he came in, it was like, you know, 15, 16 paces. He'd pause for about a second, and that was it, and then he'd keep going because he was sniffing out the dough that was just there about 10 minutes prior. Yeah. So, yeah, he was on a mission, but he didn't make it. <laughs> so had, had enough time for the old, Correct. old rifle. So Correct. Yeah. It's... Well, and that goes back to comfort zone. Yeah. I, that, I, you know, grew up on that weapon. So, you know, obviously with the background that I have, you know, it's... There wasn't any doubt in my mind that I kind of had an idea where he was going to stop. So that's where the crosshairs were. And I'm watching with my left eye, which is the non-scope eye. So I'm watching there, seeing him come in. I'm like, okay, he's about to come in frame. So then I started tracking him. And I only tracked him for about three feet and he paused right there. Yeah. Well, and, and you're, you're comfortable with the weapon. You're anticipating where that animal's going to move. And that's the, that's the other thing just from being in a stand you know even even on the hunts where you have deer in front of you and you don't kill anything being in a stand and just simply watching whitetail behavior in front of you in that environment it helps you for those moments because even though th- elements can change the weather can change the wind can change maybe it's the rut maybe it's not you know not saying it, nothing's off the table by any means but whether you realize it or not you're subconsciously taking notes of where these deer are coming from where they're where they're going to their path of travel their and you know yeah. their means of egress all that kind of stuff so when it does come time archery rifle anything when it does come time to take that shot or to get prepared ahead of where that deer is going for that shot you already know in your mind what to expect and nine times out of ten it'll pretty closely fall into place in my opinion yeah it would, it, that one worked out perfect I, like i said i only track him about three feet with the optic and then it was he, he made the pause and made the mistake yeah so i wasn't gonna even he wasn't speed demon through there or anything but i wasn't gonna take a moving shot on him probably could have i mean literally like 30 yards yeah with, with a rifle i know <laughs> i know we talked about uh I know we talked about your last season in your first podcast with us, 136. Um, I don't remember if I asked you this question in that episode or not. Did you realize how big that deer was? I I had an idea, but I mean, for me, I I don't I don't have anything to reference it to. So for me, I was like, wow, that's bigger than the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, he looks legal. Let's go for it. So, you know, and then I get him and I was like, sweet. This guy, yeah, he's he's spread all the way. I mean, his antlers were outside of my waistline. Yeah. So, you know, I was like, hey, I guess this one's all right. Have you, put a, have you put a tape to him yet? No, I haven't. We can pull him off the wall and do that, though. We uh, we, we should do that one of these days because I'm, I'm curious. Because I'm putting that deer, I think that deer's every bit of 150. He should be. Uh, if he didn't have that broken G2, he'd probably be in the 60s. Because, I mean, deer. he lost about, I would say, safely five, six inches just on that. And he had another broken time, too. So, yeah. Yeah, I think he was real close. He's all there, for yeah. sure. Good buck. Especially uh, especially on your own little place, too. It's... Well, and then we can settle the debate, too, because Carrie thinks hers is bigger. <laughs> So yeah, we're gonna have we to can. fix that. Let's. Uh, I'll. I'll bring my tape measure next time I come over. <laughs> we'll take them both down. We'll run the tape and then settle it once and for all. And she can apologize to me. <laughs> we'll have it all laid out. There you go. Um, what a. Uh, we're in August now. Season's gonna be here before we know it. What I know, we've talked about it in bits and pieces over the course of the past several weeks with you coming on and off the podcast. What uh, what are things looking like as far as the intel you're getting from your trail cams out there on your place? 
Well, the first thing I want to say is uh, I think I rose up one or two episodes ago. Maybe it was the last one uh, when I was whining because it was raining all the time. <laughs> that, <laughs> that didn't age well. Yeah. It's, so it's uh, yeah. we're feeling the effects of that for sure. Yeah, fifty right at fifty days without rain now. It's or it's anything rough. worth counting, I guess. Yeah. Um, so as far as what's going on back there, I was a little bit concerned because you know I brought you back and showed you that I moved the feeders and stuff. They were, it's a little bit more of a protected area now. Um, but it's also further for them to travel from where they're bedding down. They're bedding down on the ranch and everything that's behind our property. And so I'm just, I added, what, 40 yards yeah. in an unfamiliar area. And of course I go out there and I did all kinds of work to it and everything too. So it didn't, didn't look natural at first because I had everything chopped down and harrowed and leveled and moved all the deadfall and all that. So, I mean, yeah, they were all ooked out by it at first. And there wasn't a lot of activity at all. It was pretty much just the, the doe and the yearlings. Of course, had a good time watching her, too. Um, I remember I sent you that text message about the uh, the maternity pictures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I thought she might have had twins again this year because she was big. But it was just the one. So I only have one fawn back there right now because I guess the other... The other doe, she might have met her demise with a car because I saw several of them since the rut and everything. So there's been several that got hit around here. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, we have the one doe, the fawn. The two yearlings are still there from last year. So one's a buck, one's a doe. So we'll have another doe coming up. Um, and he's doing good. He might actually fork this year. Yeah. He's. It looks like he's got little knobs on the top, so... So he might actually fork. Um, now there was uh, a, a double spike last year. He's two and a half this year, and he is a six pointer and a good looking six already. Yeah, I mean he's big. And then there was a four point last year that turned in. He's a, he's an eight. He doubled. Of course they'd never had protein before, and now all of a sudden they're they've yeah, been eating protein say, for a year or so. Protein since you got the place right. so. So it made a difference. Um, so they're they're growing fast, and I mean even that yearling, you know the buck. I mean he's he's almost as big as the doe is already, and he's he's just over a year old. Yeah. Um, then there was another one last year. There was a small six and a big six. I haven't seen the big six yet. That was one that I wanted to get rid of. Um, but the small six, I think, has blossomed into the one that I've been sending you pictures of. Yeah. And I think he was three and a half last year. So I think he possibly a shooter this year. He's got a belly on him too already. So yeah. I mean, even with the drought and not having rain for forever, he's still looking good. Yeah. So I mean, they're not huge and filled out, obviously. Is, but... is he traveling with the the now six point? Yes. Okay. Yeah, those are the two. I texted you that one morning when when I was after I got to work that two of your deer yep. ran in front of my truck. <laughs> I think I it know. was those two boys. They're flirting with disaster too. They better make it through October. Yeah. Well, they won't make it through October, but one of them won't. Yeah, they took their time crossing the road. I'm so sure. I wasn't complaining because I got a pretty good look at them. They're nice little I, deer. I, I go to work, and I'm routinely rolling down my window and yelling at a deer to get off the road. <laughs> Mike talks to his deer. <laughs> they know my voice. The fawn, the other day, the fawn was trapped. He was running the fence line. He was freaking out because I was up there with the chickens, and he's losing his mind, and I yelled at him, and he stopped, and he looked. Just kind of calmly walked away after that. It was weird. Call you a deer whisperer. They, uh, yeah, they responded. And the two, uh, the six and the eight, they were back there when I was filling up the feeders the other day when I thought the protein feeder was broke. Um, they were taking off running across the open, uh, the open grass back there in the pasture. And they were probably 60, 70 yards away from me. Um, yelled at them. They both stopped and they looked. And just kind of watched. They didn't leave. Well, they're getting used to you being around, too, mm -hmm. for the most part. So, Well, the guys at work tell me I have a petting zoo back there. I was going to say, I, didn't, I wasn't going to call them your pets or anything. Like, we don't want to go that far. But, <laughs> I mean, you, you you live on the property. Like, they, yeah, they see, me they all the see time. you all the time. So. And the dogs, I mean, I had the dogs out back one night, and they were barking and being stupid. So I go out there, and I yell at them, and then I hear the doe barking. Yeah. So I made the dogs come in. Yeah. Yeah, gave deference to the deer. Yeah. 
<laughs> they want to run them out of there. <laughs> That's what's funny, man. Like when when it comes to a deer hunter, you're they <laughs> the deer always get uh-huh. always get preference. Dogs are yapping, gonna yell at the dogs. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> Knock it off. It's not that time yet. Yeah. How much protein are you feeding? Uh, I'm running. Oh man, what do I have it set on? I think six seconds twice a day. So it's probably not quite enough. I'm gonna have to up that now that the foliage and everything dried up so uh next time i go fill it uh, which probably be either next week or the week after i'm gonna up it up to about i don't know maybe nine or ten um so routinely i've got well let's see well i got five generations of, of boys back there right now so there's at any given time at least seven that hit the feeder twice a day so you can do the math on that on what yeah. you should be putting out there but i'll put a little bit more out because they they're eating it so it's not getting wasted and the raccoons aren't raiding it anymore so that's a plus that's good are you mixing it with corn at all or just doing... not the protein i'm i'm spinning out i think uh, i think i'm doing six seconds on the on the corn spinner too so and that's that's more for the baby yeah because he can't reach up there yet yeah but um yeah so there's get they're getting some corn and I mean, they're still eating the corn, even though it's it really does nothing for them at this point. But. Well, yeah, deer, deer like that. Yeah. So, so um, but yeah, they're they're routinely there's there's seven for sure, and I expect as things continue to dry out, some of those other ones, you know, those three from last year, um, I swear that I got a glimpse of demon last uh, uh, what last week. Yeah. I, I swear that was him because that was not that six pointer at the feeder. Yeah. And the eight point didn't look comfortable. He was posted up in front of the camera, like, bro, what are you doing? Yeah. So I was pretty sure that that was him. And that particular deer has a habit of showing up once every four or five days. He did it last year. He did it all through the rut. I mean, I never saw that deer in broad daylight until he jumped in front of my truck. They tend to do that. Out here, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh so yeah he that's the only time i saw him in daylight i never saw that deer not one time you have but, daylight pictures of him oh yeah hundreds year, though. yeah he's smart yeah yeah that's uh so your demon your target buck your kind of your your second in command last year aside from the one that you ended up killing was, oh the one that i got was an accident that that wasn't I, I had no intention of taking him. I wasn't even worried about him. Right. But I mean you knew he was out there. Though. Yeah. Like he he was showing up and everything. And yeah, Demon I I've been excited to see what Demon turns into this year cuz he's last year he was an impressive buck and hopefully that's your boy that's that's showing up there cuz well, that's going to be a stud this year. That December picture where he was all filled out and looked like he was flexing in front of the feeder. Yeah. That was insane. Yeah. He's a big deer. So, yeah, if he I mean, even if he comes back and he's still a seven, I don't even care. No, he's a mature. But he'll, yeah, he's he. Mature. Well, he was mature last year. Yeah. You know, and and it was just he's got a funky set of genes in him, and you know, kind of not getting fed a whole lot the last few years. So he's an adult and never been fed. Yeah. So, yeah, he might have, and and I don't know. I mean, I couldn't tell on that picture that was in there, but. Um, it it didn't look like that same six pointer, you know. I can tell that six is from probably from Demon's gene pool though, right? Because it's real thick base on that main beam, whereas the one that ten pointer from last year that I got, he I mean he had a good beam, but it wasn't thick like Demon's was. Well, you also look at just the the character of the antler itself too. Mm-hmm. Like you you have. You obviously have a gene pool back there that grows the sixes and sevens, you know, in into the mature deer stage, right. not just juveniles, you know. And then you also it seems it seems like you got two gene pools back yep. there basically. You also got the ones that's growing the eight and the tens, but then you got these kind of wicked looking sixes and sevens running around too, which is in my opinion pretty cool. But, well, and that's what attracted me to him in the first place was the fact that I mean he didn't look like any other deer back right. there. He was yeah. very unique and then that big six showed up and I mean that thing I I couldn't believe how broad his spread was. It was just massive. 
but he was a six and they were thin, but his spread was huge. And I'm like, okay, neat, but he's got to go. Right. So yeah, it was kind of weird, but yeah. And, and to go back to the article, every single one of them was under 30. Yeah. <laughs> this is the way it was set up. They're yeah. all under 30 yards. Exactly. Yeah. So, but which is cool. I mean, you know, that's, that's where my comfort level was. I mean, whether it didn't matter what I was using or who I was with, I mean, I took Carrie back there a couple of times too. And, you know, she was nervous cause she'd never done it before. She prefers to be at a hundred. And I'm like, well, yeah, if you're good at a hundred, you're, you're good here too. I don't know. It's just like, it was too close, yeah. you know? Um, but you know, I mean, with where I'm at archery wise, I completely identified with what he was saying. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely correct. I'm going to probably get a little bit cocky when I get that, that single pin <laughs> and hopefully I don't do anything stupid, but I mean, you already know the story from last year. First deer I ever shot with a bow was a shot. I had no business taking. Sometimes that's how it works. <laughs> so it did. It ended up working. I chase him a long ways, but, yeah. um, but yeah, I, I, as far as the, you know, the 30 yard thing, I mean, it, it really comes down to the confidence that you have in yourself and that by extension is what you have in your hands. Yeah. So for me, I, I was obviously not comfortable with any of it. And just the fact that I went out and shot a deer by myself, having never done it before with well, that period, let alone with a bow that I've never shot before, you know, before two months prior to that, that was, that was a lot. Yeah. And, you know, so, I mean, I was borderline scared to take that 26 yard shot back there, you know, and, and then of course, you know, we talked about a few other things that happened, you know, the, the learning curve of not wearing baggy clothes. Yeah. So that further discouraged me and you know, made me really, really apprehensive, which is why I switched to, to the gun, uh, later on, because I was like, you know what, we're just going to hit pause on this and we'll practice on some pigs, yeah. which that's worked out well. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so not a lot of practice has been had, um, in that regard, but yeah, the, the the single pin side i think is going to make a big difference when it comes to ranging out you know and that might actually affect where i set stuff up because if it's you know we get that thing set up and and i'm dialing in and it doesn't matter if we range it at 38 yards and i do 38 and i'm there and it's like sinking it right in the middle it's like okay cool this really is legit so yeah now that'll affect where i can set up so i may set up a little bit further back and give them a little more breathing room instead of just like you know, being right on top of them where I can throw a rock and hit them. So that's kind of, you know, I, I, I feel it, you know, with the confidence, you know, cause yeah. it just, it's new, Yeah. but I can't see to your point. I can't see somebody who's been bow hunting, especially successfully for five, six, seven, eight, you know, 20, 30 years saying, I'm only going to shoot 30 and in that it doesn't compute for me. Yeah. And it may be an efficiency thing. It may be, you know, kind of a guarantee, but you know, this is my other, my previous life coming out. It's like, yeah, it's also complacent too. Cause you're not pushing yourself. You're not testing yourself. You're not really seeing what you can do. Not that you have to do that for real, but you need to know what you can do. And if that thing's outside of your comfort level, you still have the confidence in you and your your skills and your weapon system to be able to take that shot and put them down mm -hmm. with an ethical shot. Yeah. So. Yeah, I. Again, like you down here, I make my own setups. I build the environment I want to shoot my deer in. So. To a certain extent, I can control what those distances are. Those distances are normally fairly short. Like I, I think. I think one of the longest shots that I have, and it's not even right at the feeder, it's like the backside of it is like 35 yards at one of my setups. Everything is, is under that that I'm creating, if you will. Um, but I practice out farther. One, because I want to push myself and I enjoy the challenge. 
I just like shooting long range. I really do. Um, but then also, you never know what's going to happen. If I get an invitation mm-hmm. to go out west, I want to be able to just turn that switch on and right. be good to go. Yeah, might need a little knock a little bit of dust off and brush up a little bit, you know, but it's not foreign. I've done it before and you know, I keep up with it regularly enough that it's not it's not gonna be a struggle to, you know, kick that kick back into that gear, if you yeah. will. So yeah, I uh for sure I understand that. So Well and that's kinda you know, to go back to something that we were talking about a couple weeks ago too. Um with the backyard, I mean, regardless of whether it goes into something else or not, I mean, I still kind of want to do that same thing anyway, just for us to play with. Yeah, put some targets out there. Exactly, yeah. different ranges, different elevations, so you can know exactly what your what your bow is going to do. You know, if you're if you're ten, you know, well, not ten, that gear going to be thirty feet higher unless you're shooting from the top of a tree. But you know, if you're if you're three or four meters higher than than your target is. Well, that valley in the backyard that mimics that perfectly. Yeah. So if you're shooting from a tree stand or you're just shooting downhill. Understanding your your arrow flight coming out of your, this is for anybody, coming out of your bow specifically, I think is very important. And definitely something that I try to take to heart. Under, because under, you want to understand where where it's shooting flat, when it where it is you know, you're getting more of that arc where you're literally like floating it down into a long range target and that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I, I don't shoot this bow anymore. This was years ago. I still remember, um, the one year that I shot in the, uh, firefighter archery Olympics. It was a blast. And that's another conversation for another time. (laughs) But the, they had this one target, of course they're all 3d animal targets and it was, it was a frog, it was just this huge frog is what the target was, just a stupid looking target. And from where the pin, from where the stake was, it was four yards. And I'm looking at it like, are you serious right now? Like this is, this is easy. <laughs> and the first guy goes up there, we're in a group of like, you know, five or six of us going through there, walking the course together. First guy goes up and he shoots it and he almost shoots clear over the top of this thing. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? This it didn't make any sense to me. It's right there. It's 12 feet away from you. And one of the guys, um, he'd been an archer for a long time, a lot longer than I had. He came up to me and he was like, hey, when you shoot this target, use your 40 yard pin. And I was like, my 40 yard <laughs> pin? I was like, are, are you serious? You want me to use my 40 yard pin? He goes, yeah, just try it. So I did, and I shot, and shot pretty dead center of that stupid little frog. And I looked at him, and I was like, you're going to have to explain this to me. He goes, you have to understand how your arrow comes out of your bow. And at these shorter distances that are under even 10 yards, you know, because normally you can use that 20-yard pin for those, uh, for those shots that are like, you know, 18, 17, mm-hmm. you know, 16 yards in there. But he said, when you start getting sub 10, he goes, you really have to think about your arrow flight and think about what your arrow is doing that soon after it comes out of your bow before it really has a chance to, to have any sort of arc or path of travel or flight or anything like that. Um, he said, you have, you have to understand how all that works with your site specifically. He goes, I use 40 on mine. So that's why I told you to use 40 on yours run a similar setup I figured it'd be close so that really rattled my brain for sure on that and that's when I really started paying closer attention for those short shots not that I think the shortest shot I've ever taken on a deer was 19 yards so Mm -hmm. or 16 yards so it's never been that close by any means but it made me think about it you know for sure and it's something that anybody can play around with too um because another thing I encourage people to do when they're as a part of their shooting, especially when you, you know, January, February season ends, you put the bow up, you kind of don't think about it till the summertime. We talked about this in our last podcast. And you finally break the bow back out and start shooting and get ready for the next year. 
one thing that I really encourage people to do, and this helps alleviate bad habits, is shooting at no range, like target right in front of you, but either shooting with your eyes closed or sim not shooting to hit a bullseye, simply shooting just to get your muscle memory down and to get down your routine and everything like that when, when you shoot your anchor points, how your bow feels, how it should feel in your hand. It helps with target panic. It helps with a cleaner release with not punching the trigger, all that kind of stuff. I, I encourage folks to do that, but if you're curious, at the same time as you're doing that, that's the time you can play around with, okay, well, I put my bail at four yards or three yards away from me. I'm just going to work on my release today. But let's see where I hit the target. You know, Let me put my 40 on that X and see where the arrow hits. Let me put my 30 on it and see where it hits and just play around with it because, again, that's, where, that's the time to, to practice it and mm -hmm. understand. And you can kill two birds with one stone doing that. Well, and with the arrow flight too, I mean, especially if you're talking, you know, 10 feet. Yeah. You're going to think about the two degree cant on the fletching. Has it even had time to make a rotation yeah. at that point to stabilize itself? So there's, I mean, that arrow hasn't even begun to behave yet at 10 feet. So it's just another thing to kind of... It's a it's a philosophical or not really philosophical, but it's it's goes into the theory because you can't really it's just like bullets too. I mean, unless you're recording with high speed lenses and things like that, which we don't have. I don't know anybody with a high speed camera. I, I don't have one like but that. But you're not you're gonna have to take it on a theoretical basis that this is what happens right. or this is what doesn't happen. So same thing with an arrow. I mean, I've never seen it, but. I know that the arrow flexes when it flies, Yeah, but I've never seen it in person, nor will I ever see it in person. You work at an archery um, shop long enough <laughs> and people are shooting the wrong arrows, you'll see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's that. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's just one of those things. Like, I, I've seen the videos and everything, and obviously other people have recorded these things on high-speed lenses and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I know it's there, but for me, still, it's, it's a theoretical thing. Yeah. So, you know, all those little theoretical components, you have to put those together because, yeah, it's theoretic because you can't put, you, you can't see it personally, but you know it is fact. Yeah. And these things do happen. Um, you know, talking about fletching, I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, man, I hope that super glue holds. Man, <laughs> I'm telling you. So, theoretically, it we're, should. We're here in my home office, and you can't see on the camera, but behind me is my mess but I'm, I'm building arrows back here behind the camera. But freaking Gorilla Glue, man. Just Gorilla Glue, super glue. I've, you know, all these, and first off, we're, at the time of recording this, we're not partnered with any fletching company or arrow company or anything like that, so I can say whatever I want, I guess. <laughs> but um, all these fletching companies, and I've bought into it before. Yeah. They sell, like, you can buy their fletchings. Cause, and, and this is where I got cut into it. Because when I switched from the 2-inch blazer veins that pretty much every arrow you buy comes with, when I went to a 2.75 vein, I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot this brand. I'm going to try this brand because I've heard good things. Well, on their website, of course, they sell their glue and their primer. And they guarantee that you won't have any adhesion issues if you use their glue and their primer per direction with their vein, with their wrap, you know, all this stuff. I bought everything and I built the arrows with all that stuff. It sucked. <laughs> I was losing fletchings left and right and I was so frustrated. Half the and I I I dealt with that for two seasons. I ripped the wraps off for the second season and just went with the the fletchings on the carbon and that helped a little bit. But it still like their glue, their primer, all that stuff wasn't wasn't cutting it for me. So this year I just I bought some some AAE Maxes, little three dollar bottle of yep. Gorilla Glue at the grocery store, and they're freaking gold. And that that's that's all you need. I I I, I don't want to talk bad or or tell y'all not to give your business to any of these archery companies. Obviously, you want veins, and, and I order my veins online because I want a specific vein. But when it comes to the glue guys, just get freaking Gorilla yeah. Glue. I'm using, I'm using Loctite, and that yeah. you've seen how many times I've shot those arrows. I mean, 
I'm using, I was shooting the same six arrows all year last year and not a single one came off after I switched them out. And yep. that was, that was Loctite. It's almost the exact same, probably owned by the same conglomerate company. Man, who knows? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's essentially the same product. And the reason that I went with Loctite was because that's what typically armorers use you know for rifles and stuff there's different colors of loctite different strengths and all this stuff and i figure well if they can nail it on that stuff they can probably do super glue just as well yeah sure let's go for it yeah and it's worked so um but yeah i mean that's just kind of went off and of you know it was like man in theory the super glue should hold sitting there talking about theory yeah exactly <laughs> well another thing before we get too far off of it and wrap up that i wanted to talk about with because you brought up like arrow flight and the flex and everything in the arrow made me think of it and y'all can think of it as your your tip of the week or tip of the day whatever you want to think of but um one thing that and we talked last last time we recorded 150 two or 53 i think think it was something like that um we talked last time about uh the flex in the arrow but then also the spine and we're referring to the stiffness of the arrow and having the proper spine i'm not going to completely redo that whole conversation but i've seen this before from working in a bow shop you get people that go out there on the range and they come in and they're like man all my arrows are hitting like I'm shooting, I'm shooting fine. My arrows are hitting where I want them to go, but they're they're not lined up. They're not straight from me to the target. They're hitting the target at an angle, and sometimes it's this way, sometimes it's this way. Don't you know? They're confused. It doesn't make any sense. If you guys are seeing that, it's because of one of two things. One, your spine is wrong. I mean, in that your spine could be too stiff. So if if you're an archer, or your kid or or your wife is shooting a lower poundage bow um, and their arrows are hitting the target at an angle it's because they're too stiff the bow is not putting enough energy into those arrows to give it that flex that we're talking about that what that flex does is it it keeps that arrow from completely changing itself in flight um, and hitting that target at an angle basically the arrow is too stiff with a low poundage bow to flex. So instead of the arrow flexing and maintaining a straight path of travel, it's just going to deviate. It's going to pivot, basically. And I'm I'm not using great physics. It's like it's swimming. But yeah, so when it finally hits that target, it may hit where you were aiming, but it's gonna hit at an angle because that's how it was traveling, was at an angle. That's number one issue. Number two issue would be if your bow is out of tune. If your bow is out of tune and your arrow is coming out of the bow at an angle, then it's going to have the same problems in flight. It's going to, even if it is the correct spine, it's going to be pivoting and swimming, as you say, yeah. while while it's in flight. So if you're seeing either one of those things, those are your your uh, those are your problems. For those of you that don't have much experience as a bow tech um, or in that world, once your bow is tuned, and you should, in my opinion, at least once a year before you uh, before you start hunting, you should paper tune your bow. The sooner the better, in my opinion, to check that arrow flight. But once your bow is paper tuned, do not move your arrow rest. Because that's one thing that we see in the shop is that we would have people come in, we tune their bow, we get it all fixed up, shooting bullet holes through paper. And then they would take it, we'd be like, all right, go re-sight it in or go sight it in if we built them a new setup. They'd go to the range and they'd be shooting too far to the left or too far to the right. And the first thing they did was they move their arrow rest. They just undid everything that we did to, to a point. Their, right. their, their shot is no longer centered on that bow. And that's, that's a problem. If your shot is centered and your arrow is still doing that, then that's when you have to get technical with it and you have to start twisting cables and screws and doing other stuff to adjust your cam lean and that kind of stuff but folks word of advice just do not if your bow is in tune do not move your arrow rest if you're sighting in you have issues sighting in move your sight if your bow is in tune use the sight to sight in you think it's common sense but sometimes there's disconnects so that's my tip of the day for everybody (laughs) almost akin to you know 
adjusting your barrel. Yeah. On, on a rifle if you're not Man, hitting right. <laughs> you can really bend this a little bit. As you've said, two different weapon systems, right? But everything a lo- correlates. A lot of similarities yeah. between the two. So. So there was one thing in here um, yeah. that I found interesting, and it just makes sense too because you're you're talking like. Whether you're shooting, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred yards or something with a rifle, you know, when you're shooting at that distance, it's really easy to visualize. It's like, okay, if I'm shooting this far, you know, it's gonna be X amount of time before splash, right? And you know, I was introduced to this when when I was with an artillery unit. When you're shooting like, you know, eighteen miles, the time of flight is like, I mean, you're talking sometimes upwards of you know half a minute three quarters of a minute that's a long time a lot can happen at the impact area in that time right so he puts it into perspective here which i thought was kind of cool um so say you got an arrow traveling 350 feet per second mine aren't well so and 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 that's the thing like (laughs) Like you, all these um, bows are rated at three forties, three fifties, three sixties. But you got to think too. That is at a factory, shooting the lightest weight arrow they can right. get away with, running out of a seventy pound bow with a twenty nine or thirty inch draw. No, as minimal accessories or dampening techniques on that bow. They have stripped that bow down as yeah. bare as they can to get as every foot per second they can out of it. So nobody's ever going to see those ratings right. yeah there. i mean you're you're pushing it to get 300 yeah so um but you know for the sake of math he's saying you know in feet per second one one second to travel 116 yards yeah so divide that in half you get roughly half a second to cover 58 yards um so that being said it doesn't sound like a lot of time and i don't want people to you know think of it's like half, half a second. They can't react that. Yeah, yeah, you can't react that fast. Professional baseball players are making decisions on whether to swing at a pitch in .06 seconds. Yeah. That fast. Deer are wired so tight that they're faster than a pro baseball player. And that's, I mean, I don't, I, I can't find a human being alive or dead that historically would ever be able to have the reaction time and the athleticism of a white-tailed deer or a mule deer or whatever else we're, you know. I mean, just the physical attributes they have. So if a human being can react to a 100-mile-an-hour fastball in .06 seconds to make contact, I'm sure a deer can jump your string yeah. in half a second. I've had it done to me before. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing. I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot of time. I mean, it's easier to understand when you're talking like lobbing artillery shells 18 miles versus shooting a bow 30 yards. The the time, the, the ratio is still there, but you're talking, you know, 45 seconds of time of flight to a half a second time of flight. But they can still jump it. They can still make you miss. They can still do all those things. So... To go back to what Sam was saying earlier, behavior. You got to understand what the animal does. Yes. And that was one of the big things I didn't know last year. And I was just overly cautious. But if I wouldn't have been that cautious, I would have made a lot more mistakes than I did. And that was just because I didn't understand the behavior. Yeah. I know a lot more now. I know they love green apple smell. <laughs> I really like that. Yeah. It's candy. <sighs> yeah. It's funny um, you say that. The the longest shot that I have ever killed an animal with was 48 yards. And that was after she jumped, ducked my string at 33. <laughs> this doe comes out in front of me, and it was one of those things like, and this was very early in my bow hunting career, and in hindsight, I should not have taken the second shot. I got lucky is what happened. Sounds familiar. But the, she comes in. It's one of those things. She's calm. She's slowly coming in. I can think ahead on where I'm going to take the shot. I draw back. Stop her. I shoot 33 yards. She ducks my arrow. It was not... A bow setup like what I have now either by any means but she ducks my arrow 
She takes off running. She runs behind me. I'm in a tree stand. And she just stops behind me. And behind me, I have, I don't know, probably the size of two or three base, uh, basketballs. Uh, just a hole in the trees where I can see the trail that comes in behind me. And she just she's standing in that hole and she's just standing there looking around. She's quartering away from me. And I range her 48. And I'm thinking about it, I'm like, and at this point, I'm also kind of mad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's coming into you play. You took the anger shot. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to take another shot. So I completely turned around in my tree stand, you know, moving my harness out of the way and get another arrow on, shoot, and 48 yards, dropped it right in there. Got her. Not a problem. Um, again just knowing where I was as an archer at the time, like that was my max shot that Mm -hmm. I would ever be comfortable making at that time. I probably shouldn't have taken it. I got lucky, but it's funny because all in one hunt, one experience, I have a deer that ducks my, that ducks my arrow and I have the longest shot I've ever killed an animal (laughs) with. I've only killed two animals over 40 and it was that doe. And then my pronghorn in 2018, he was at 42. So everything else has been under 40. And it doesn't sound, I mean, this whole thing is like, I'm still sitting here. I'm just like, oh yeah, you know, it's 40, it's less than 50 yards. It's not that bad. And then you get out there and you actually try and put an arrow in the red circle at 50 yards. I was like, nope, can't see it. Yeah. All right, sweet. The, Go ahead and try and guess this one. The other thing that will make somebody just more confident in those shorter shots and one thing that I that I try to do um, right now, I'm trying to finish sighting in a bow, so I'm not doing it yet uh, with this one, but I will be soon, is when I practice, especially when you are preparing and you're trying to shoot those longer ranges, like when I hit the range, especially in 2019 when I was like had that high 100-yard standard of a softball, when I hit the range, I would warm up at 40. Like I wouldn't, I would warm up at 40, I would shoot 40 and, and beyond for the meat of everything. And then when I was almost done, when I was wrapping up shooting, I would go back to 20 and 30. Mm -hmm. And after you've been shooting 70, 80, 90, 100, 20 feels like it's right Right. in front of your face. And you talk about just building confidence because you've already, your senses are heightened. You've already been just super super attentive to every little detail shooting these longer distances and then you you come back all the way to 20 yards and you apply it and you better be shooting at different circles because otherwise you're going to lose <laughs> arrows at that point it, it, it builds confidence and you and it it helps you at those at those ranges for me that was the best way for me to prepare for both what i do in texas and what i was trying to do out mm-hmm. west and that's what i'm going to be doing this year after I finished getting this Omnia dialed in, um, cause I have that Colorado hunt coming up this year and that's going to be my, my school of thought is I'm going to start at those longer distances and prepare for that. And then I'll come back and just fling a few at 20 and 30 yeah. again, just to drive it home in my mind, what that feels like and be good to go. I'm going to have to do that too. Of course I got some work to put in on mine once my toys get here. <laughs> yeah. Well, so. I, I imagine I'll probably. Sounds like I got a day to come over there. I gotta, I gotta. We gotta get that sight on your bow. Yep. We gotta get that dialed in. I gotta tape out a couple of bucks uh-huh. on the wall and settle a debate. So well, and, and <laughs> yeah, and we can also walk off the fifty yards at least, fifty, sixty yards in the back too, and not have to cross a ravine. Still yeah. have at least that much. So, you know, we can get some work in too. Yeah, be good. So. Well, man, we will uh, we'll probably wrap it up on the podcast, but I appreciate you coming on again and talking a little archery. I'm passionate about it. I love it. That's that's where I dive in and, and really go deep on some stuff. So well, that's why I'm not afraid to you know buy stuff. I have no idea what I'm buying. I'm like, hey, man, what do you think of this? Yeah, they're good. All right, cool. <laughs> hey, man, I bought that thing. Oh, you did? Yeah, I don't know how to put it on. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so. well we'll figure it out we'll, we'll get you situated so not a problem alright guys thank you all for listening to another Fall Obsession podcast we're going to wrap it up for this one um, you guys know the drill all the social media places be sure that you guys like and follow Fall Obsession subscribe to the podcast 
that's how you guys can show your support for uh, small time hunting brands such as ourselves. Don't miss next week's Monday morning episode. I think you guys are going to like it. And uh, get out and shoot your bow. It's that time of year. So thanks for listening. We'll catch you on the next one.